So for the first case, I have this 76 year female uh, who complains of abdominal pain. And here we have the finding. So this is non-contrast by the way. And so there are many findings, but the most prominent finding, maybe you can see it. So what do you think might be the source or the cause of this lesion? Or the first question is, where is this collection located? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the colon to see if it's retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal. It looks like the colon is pushed all the way to the right side, even mm -hmm. the, the descending colon. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking it's retroperitoneal, but mm -hmm. it also looks like it might be touching the ovary down there. Wait, where's the... There's the uh, yeah, tough to tell about the ovary, but yeah, definitely since the descending colon itself is a uh, retroperitoneal uh, structure in the anterior pararenal space. So, and this thing is pushing it anteriorly and across the midline. Sorry, this is the new one. Okay, this is the old one, yeah. So yeah, definitely this looks like retroperitoneal. So any idea whether it is simple or complex, It looks complex. I'm, I'm thinking it looks like it has soft tissue nodularity, although I guess on this non-con, we can't tell the difference between blood products and soft tissue. So I would want mm -hmm. a post-contrast or an MRI, but it looks complex. And yeah, I'm definitely. concerned for soft tissue component, like a, a mass. Mm. So, um, so when I think about retroperitoneal lesions, I think about sarcomas, although this doesn't mm. really look like a liposarcoma. Um, mm. You can get... Um, Lyomyosarcomas of vessels. You can get solitary mm -hmm. fibrous tumors. You can also get mucinous neoplasms with malignant degeneration. And you can get a lot of nerve tumors like cystic schwannoma, mm -hmm. lymphangioma. So this thing was not present uh, two weeks ago. So does that help you narrow down the diagnosis? <laughs> No, so I'm from the spine, any reason why the right kidney is absent and there are spinal post-op changes? Yeah, actually, there was a thing that I did not mention. This patient recently underwent spine surgery. Whoa, is that like a CSF leak? Uh, yeah, that's a good thought. But probably if this was CSF, then the patient would be, you know, like very, very, uh, <laughs> like very severe intracranial hypotension. Like a hematoma, seroma? Uh, yeah, again, but this patient was not uh, hemodynamically unstable. So was it hematoma, then patient would have been, I think, really, really hemodynamically unstable. And patient was not complaining of headache, you know, like, or findings suggestive of uh, intracranial hypotension either. What do you think? Uh, Lymph is... Lymphocele? Yes, yes, that's right, Doc. Wow. So actually, uh, the spine surgery, it's usually done by retroperitoneal approach. But in this case, they, for some reason that I don't understand on the operative report, they did from, uh, sorry, from posterior as well as anterior approach. And I see this thing, I don't know, maybe it's incidental, but this is not within the vertebral body. It's going outside. So in this area, uh, definitely there are some lymphatic vessels, but also there are these all uh, surgical clips uh, along the iliac vessels where there might have been lymphatic channels. So this was most likely uh, the site of the lymph uh, lymphatic leakage. So this patient underwent uh, drainage by IR. And so here we see the drain drainage tube and the amount or the collection has decreased significantly only we can see little bit of, uh, I think this is some, the solid, suppose uh, the, the, the lower most area contains some, uh, probably this was blood products or, so that we can see. 
on the inferior aspect as a residue, but most of the uh, cystic component has resolved. Yeah, and that thing down there isn't just the uterus. Uh, uterus is, I think, this one. It looks like it's connected to that thing, but anyway, it, do, it doesn't matter. Wow, that's a huge lymphocele. That's that's cool. Yeah, and the weird thing is, uh, on surgery, they said they drain around three three liters of lymphatic fluid, which I don't know, maybe they did not measure correctly because it's almost like 20 or like 29 centimeter. Yeah, almost like 30 centimeters. So it should be at least, I don't know, maybe 10 liters or so. But the operative note says around three liters. So. But yeah, anyways, this was the first case of uh, post-surgical retroperitoneal lymphocele. And I have another case. So this was 63 year female and she has this huge, ugly, around 15 centimeter. Again, this is without, con oh, sorry, this is with contrast. I, uh, but I don't have with contrast axial, but I have with contrast coronal and sagittal. So what do you think this thing in the left lower quadrant is? Is that the gallbladder displaced over there? Yes, yes. <laughs> so there was uh, interesting to me because this lesion is so big that it is pushing almost all of the liver except a thin margin. And the gallbladder is somewhere here. And instead we have this big lesion and here is tough to say, but this is the kidney and here you can see the claw sign. An interesting similar appearing lesion is seen on the uh, left side as well. So here, but the left kidney as such itself looks normal. Where is it? Uh, yeah. So there is no claw sign between the, with the left kidney. So this and the left adrenal is separate. There's a tiny nodule, but yes, we have this bilateral masses one is has claw sign with the right kidney the other one is separate so any guesses and that right-sided one just reminded me of like a huge rcc mm. and then the left i was thinking was an adrenal met but you're showing it separate from the adrenal so it's maybe a yeah. met or yeah, the whole so thing is different <laughs> i don't know it looks almost the same and they biopsy the right side. They found RCC. Uh, yeah. Is the like, left side coming from the bowel? Uh, it's tough to say, but given it's almost similar to the right side and the right side is so huge. Uh, we didn't biopsy the left side, but we thought maybe it's also like mates from the right side at RCC. Actually, it's posterior to the uh, stomach. Uh, yeah, it does not look very close to the bowel, though it is here, but it's not. Yeah, there is a fat plane between this and, and this looks posterior to the pancreatic tail. Yeah, so I think it's uh, RCC with the meds. But the question is, I have one question. So the right-sided RCC, could it have this big mess on the contralateral side in the retroperitoneum? I haven't seen such case uh, frequently. Yeah, I would kind of be concerned that that's a separate, you know, especially without other METs, other places from the mass. Mm. I'd be worried that that is something, you know, it still could be a MET, but mm. either in like the pancreatic tail or but I kind of worry that it might be something else. I feel like with that big of an RCC, that is most probably a MET. Um, but I think, um, like you said, Swachanda, it's not usual to just not be connected to anything, but it can, they can definitely met to the mesentery, retroperitoneum. So oh, I always okay. tell my residents, like the most common places are lung, bones, 
Um, they love mm -hmm. the pancreas, but also they love any, you know, muscle soft tissue. So always do an extra check through the muscles and subcutaneous tissues and mesentery. Oh, got you. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, those are the two cases. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Gitanjali? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so pregnancy MRI, uh, she's at 36 weeks. Uh, they were working her up for IUGR. And on clinical exam and ultrasound, they thought she has an anterior abdominal wall hernia. And to evaluate it, uh, they got this MR done. So what do we see here? I think this is a companion case to last week's case. Yeah, I wasn't there last week, but yeah, you told me that we had a case of. Yeah, and actually we have a recent case too. I have to, I have to show it next week of um, an interesting pregnancy, but I'm seeing low fluid, amniotic fluid with the baby and that the pregnancy is anterior to the bladder. Yes. But it doesn't, it almost looks like the uterus has like flopped over anterior to the bladder. Yes. Yeah. That's all. That, that's all it is in this case that the uterus has flopped over anteriorly. And it's because I think, uh, I mean, she, she was morbidly obese and uh, it was just a complication of pregnancy that she had like weakness of the anterior abdominal wall. We hardly see any musculature, uh, significant fatty atrophy of the rectus muscles, bulging fascia. So probably that couldn't hold the gravid uterus and the uterus just flops anteriorly. And this is what we call anterior uterine incarceration. Um, it's we try to search it there was like i don't think it's a common thing and uh, probably now with obesity being a, an epidemic i think we'll get to see more and more cases but uh, there was hardly any mention there was just one case report we found but that also had a very limited access but um, uh, i think there is an, a mention of anterior uterine incarceration in literature and it's just um, uh, contrast to posterior incarceration. In posterior incarceration, there's a proper definition where they say the uterus gets stuck between the pubic symphysis and sacral promontory. For anterior incarceration, I couldn't find any such definition, but yeah, I mean, it's creating a lot of mass effect and it has come anterior to the bladder. So maybe. Wow. And is that what is causing the IUGR? Like um, just not having yes. enough space yes. there to incarcerate in? Okay. Yes. But luckily, uh, the good part was uh, uh, she's already 36 weeks. Uh, so they did a cesarean section and both the baby and mother are doing good. Oh, good. I was thinking the fluid looked low, but um, yeah. maybe. But, yeah, maybe... At 36 weeks, yeah, the baby was still doing okay. I think it was just yeah. a recent thing. So it didn't affect the pregnancy that much. Nice. Isn't it rewarding when you research something that you've never seen before and you come up with something that looks like the real deal and you, th you think <laughs> made a secure diagnosis. Yeah, I think uh, that is actually a good scope to write up on these if we have a couple more cases. Uh, uh, there's not much that I could find um, in literature on this. And just like I pulled up that old case, which we have already showed just for comparison, this was a case of posterior uterine incarceration. Now, this is something where we'll have, we have found multiple case reports uh, there in ACR case in point as well. Very well-known entity, but this anterior uterine incarceration was something that we thought is like a new thing. The other side of the coin is when you see something that looks quite abnormal and you can't find a secure diagnosis in the literature anywhere and you're just scratching your head. I hate that. Yeah, that, that's the even more difficult situation. So that was all on this one. Then another uh, quick um, show and tell case, uh, probably don't, don't know much about it. So I'll probably ask the group what they think. So I'll just show the images first. It's a prostate MR. Was there any, any, excuse me, any prior prostate intervention? Not so far. Oh, I think, yeah, they've, they've done um, um, transurethral resection of prostate in the past, I think, yes. So this is the post-contrast uh, diffusion, uh, facilitated diffusion. This is post-contrast um, enhancement within the lesion. Um, so this was- uh, Think about like a stump tumor versus a mucinous adenocarcinoma. 
Yes, that's uh, mucinous and stump tumor. Those were the things that we thought of. Um, the other uh, confusing part in the history in this patient was we got a history that he had history of solitary fibrous tumor uh, in the lungs and that was resected a uh, couple years ago. And this mass was incidentally detected on CTs, not that he presented with elevated PSA and we were just working him up for uh, presence of prostatic carcinoma. And uh, looks slightly like eccentric within the gland. I'm not sure if it's like truly also within the gland or it's just pushing the capsule to the side. So this one they biopsied and this uh, turned out to be uh, mesonephric remnants, mesonephric remnant hyperplasia. Again, this is something that I had not heard of before and, and I tried to search for it. Um, uh, there are, uh, uh, like there's a lot of mention of this entity in the pathology literature, but again, I couldn't find a single radiology case describing this. So I don't know, maybe my search was not good enough or if you all know anything about it, but that's what the biopsy said, uh, mesonephric um, remnant hyperplasia on this one. And in pathology, they say that this is an, uh, a, a benign mimic of prostatic adenocarcinoma. So in pathology, it may look similar, but I mean, obviously on imaging, it looks completely different from our classic uh, adenocarcinomas are. What's the management going to be? I mean, it looks like it could be something that's, that's causing urinary outlet flow obstruction potentially. Yeah, so um, I think um, they did a second transurethral resection, but I don't have any post-op imaging to show how things look after that, so. Yeah, and, done you that. think on the second terp that they got some of this material out of there? Not sure. This was they probably was operated somewhere outside. I don't have a detailed op note here, but they say that status post uh, transurethral resection after the scan. This is so cool. I'm looking it up, and yeah, mm -hmm. it's exactly what I mean. I've yeah never heard of this, but um, they say it's like it can grow in this like papillary way. It mimics high grade prostate cancer. It has no clinical significance. Yeah, like this is totally something totally benign. So they weren't really um, concerned about this once it, the path report came out. I think just for uh, 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 relieve the outlet obstruction, they did a transurethral resection. But after that, the patient didn't show, like there, there are no follow-ups on this after that. So Always something new to learn. I was also looking up to see if it was related to the utricle cyst, but utricles are embryologic remnants of the Mullerian duct system. Whereas you're talking about the mesonephric system. Yeah, that's like, yeah, there's so many things that are related to malarian remnants, but this was mesonephric remnants. So that was confusing too in the beginning, but yeah. And so is that related to the, the kidney then, mesonephric? But this one, like, I mean, there's no associated, like how you get um, renal yeah. agenesis or anything, but nothing of that sort was described with this entity. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna pause it for a sec. Okay, so this first case, um, this is a post-operative exam and it's kind of a mess, it's a, it's a non-contrast, so I'm not expecting you to get the diagnosis, but I just, we were reading the scan and um, the patient had a history of chronic pancreatitis. This is their pancreas here. Um, there's some calcifications here and then, um, there's basically a jejunal loop that they've connected to the pancreatic head. And um, this is the preoperative exam where you could see the pancreas was atrophic. There's dilation of the duct. There's some calcifications. And then there was this big calcification in the distal pancreatic duct that was causing recurrent pancreatitis. Um, it was also causing this biliary obstruction. Um, so does anyone know what procedure they, they did between this? Uh, they did not do a Whipple. They did something, um, a different kind of treatment for chronic pancreatitis. Um, anyone know the type, types of procedures they do for those? I, I have a hard time judging it, but I know they can do a Pusto where they basically take a jejunal loop and plug it into the dilated pancreas duct. 
Yes, good, good, good. So this was actually a fray procedure. Um, a fray procedure is where they core out the pancreatic head and then and then um, tie a piece of jejunum to it. So in this case, um, this is actually our duodenal loop here, but um, and it's very hard to tell. This is non-contrast, but there is a piece of jejunum that is coming up and basically attached to this pancreatic head here. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple of things. So this is what a fray procedure is. This is a really nice AJR paper where they have these beautiful um, diagrams, but um, it's basically they're trying to preserve the duodenum and the ampulla, and they but they're trying to get rid of the fibrosis from chronic pancreatitis in the pancreatic head. So they'll scoop out and scrape out um, as much as they can of that fibrosis, and then um, attach a piece of jejunum. Um, mine, my patient did not have jejunum going all the way up the pancreas, but um, but they did have this jejunal loop kind of um, connected to this pancreatic head. So that'll drain the main pancreatic duct um, this way. There's a couple of other procedures. So this is a pusto. This is where they fillet open the entire pancreas and um, put a longer piece of jejunum um, along it. And so the, the duct and all the side branches are draining directly into it. Uh, and there's one more called a beaker procedure, but I've, I've, I don't think they do this that much anymore um, where they basically kind of um, divide the pancreas into two segments and have like, instead of just flaying it open, they actually just um, remove the body and then have these two anastomoses. So I have a couple of companion or at least one companion case. Um, so this is a patient who um, had a pusto procedure and I find these just very difficult to see the anatomy well, but basically this is the remnant pancreas. And then this is the piece of jejunum that is located in this abnormal location right on top of the pancreas that is basically anastomosed to the entire body of the pancreas here. And then this is the head of the pancreas with the pancreatic duct coming out of it. So if you see a piece of jejunum stuck to the pancreas, um, they could have had a pusto or uh, procedure, or if it's stuck to the pancreatic head and they still have their duodenal C-sweep, then they could have had a fray. Um, an interesting aspect of this case, this patient who had a pusto, um, this is 15 years later, and actually their pancreas, their remnant pancreas is now severely atrophic. It's right here. And that jejunal loop has all these enhancing fronds uh, within it. And this is actually biopsy proven jejunal adenocarcinoma that developed um, in that jejunal loop. So I don't know if there was something about, you know, the pancreatic juices draining into it that caused dysplasia and then eventually adenocarcinoma. But um, this was a pretty dramatic example of that in the pusto loop. Any questions? Okay. I've mesmerized you all with my confusing pancreas cases. Um, and then this is another interesting case from, okay, so this patient, um, I want you to tell me what you think about their colon. So I'll start down here. You can see the rectum, sigmoid. It's pretty thickened, but, um, and then this is the transverse colon. Where's the house draw? Yeah, ulcerative colitis. Yes, exactly. So when I saw this, I said, oh, okay, this patient looks like they have ulcerative colitis. Um, it's very ahaustral looking. There's like hyperemia of the vessels around it. It's thickened and inflamed. Um, and so I thought, you know, they had ulcerative colitis. And um, in fact, they do have a history of ulcerative colitis. But um, this was about six months ago. Um, you can see this is what their colon looked like. Um, it's decompressed, but to me, it didn't look as, as abnormal. And then if we get to the transverse colon where we saw it looked really ahaustral before, um, there's free air here. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But this is what their transverse colon looked like six months ago. So you could actually still see the house truck. And it looks to me like the, um, the wall is much less thick about six months ago and like that everything has gotten a lot worse. Um, and so what happened was that this patient got a colonoscopy for ulcerative colitis 
Um, there was mild diffuse colitis and they did a biopsy and actually they ended up perforating the colon and that's why we have this free air here. Um, so they got a colonic perforation, they had free air. The perforation, interestingly, let's put this back on the other windows, but um, it was actually in the sigmoid colon, um, which we, I thought was a little weird and unusual, but um, there was more inflammation in the sigmoid colon. There was a one centimeter perforation in the sigmoid colon in the operating room. Um, I thought it was interesting that the air had collected really far away from the sigmoid colon, but it just kind of goes to show you the air rises. So this is not necessarily a, you know, a clue that it's coming from the upper abdomen, even though most of the air is collecting up here. So um, basically what they did was there's a perforation here. They did a diverting ileostomy and six months later they went and, and reduced. So they, they reversed the ileostomy um, and this is what it looked like. And their colon looks a lot worse. So does anyone know what could have happened to this colon um, in this six months to make it this much worse? And I'll tell you, it was not a worsening of their ulcer ulcerative colitis. It's another entity that, um, so Swachanda says disuse, good. Um, do you know why? What about disuse would cause your colon to become more inflamed? Do you know anything, uh, any kind of colitis that comes when, you're, when you've diverted your colon and so you have an ileostomy and now Swachanda is guessing C. diff, good thought. This was not C. diff. Is it kind of like a bacteria or the overgrowth? Um, good. So it's actually related to bacteria, but it's not an overgrowth. <laughs> so it is something called diversion colitis. And I didn't know about this. So I wanted to show this to you guys. Um, I'm going to pull up some articles just to show you that I didn't make this up. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is the up-to-date article um, about it. But basically, diversion colitis is a, a nonspecific inflammatory disorder that is seen in about 80% of patients who have colonic diversion, although most of the time they're asymptomatic. Um, but an interesting aspect is that it is much worse in patients who have baseline inflammatory bowel disease like UC or Crohn's. And a couple of the theories on how it develops is that basically you've got your either ileostomy or colostomy. You have this part that is not being used. Um, and um, related to the bacteria, basically it is not getting the same flow of bacteria that you would get normally. And the bacteria that are missing are not making sh um, sh short chain fatty acids like butyrate. And actually those short chain fatty acids help protect your colonic mucosa from oxidative damage. So it's actually the lack of bacteria that you're getting, not bacterial overgrowth, but the lack of bacteria that are not making short chain fatty acids that cause your um, mucosa to become inflamed and, and have oxidative stress. Um, so a couple of the, so the, um, and, it, and also there's some increasing aerobic bacteria and lack of short chain fatty acids, that's this SCFA. So um, some of the treatments they use for this is that they actually do enemas of these short chain fatty acids and they can um, give it to you in your blood and that can help your um, diversion colitis. They have three different grades of it. And if it's the most severe grade, um, that's basically an indication to reverse um, your ostomy. So anyway, I just thought this was interesting. I, and um, they actually went in and scoped this patient and they biopsied it. And they said they saw signs of both ulcerative colitis as well as diversion colitis. So something I just recently learned from my uh, GI folks. Okay, that's it for me. Anyone else? Kadar, you've had. So it sounds like the gas, it sounds like the gastroenterologist could tell the difference between the colitis that was caused by UC versus the colitis that was caused by this disorder. The pathologist, yeah. And I think that it's not super clear. I think that it's um, there's overlap, but um, same way that there's overlap between like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But I think there are some different um, findings that they see on pathology that help them suggest it. So they did like mucosal biopsies or samples and then- Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went and did a flex sig and, and um, they, they did biopsies and they basically brought up both of these entities. And to me, it makes sense that like in six months, you know, on the imaging, it seemed to get a lot worse. Um, and I didn't really know what that was about. And they were like, oh yeah, this is diversion colitis. And then according to up to date, like 80% of diverted colons actually have this. 
Um, so I thought that was interesting because I was like, I've never even heard of this. Why? <laughs> but um, so, you know, I, I guess like, you know, and especially, I think it's especially worse in these um, IBD patients. So if you see it, if you see worsening colitis or if they're not an IBD patient and you just see like new colitis from a diverted colon, that could be diversion colitis. Thanks. Adati, I can show one case. Great. Uh, it's not a great case. It's just a call case and it's kind of a, oh, one second. I have a, don't start the recording. Uh, 41 year old lady with history of um, ectopic pregnancy on the left uh, and uh, has had a left oophorectomy um, in the past. And now she presented with right lower quadrant pain. So um, they first decided to do a CT. This was on call. So I'm just going to scroll down, starting at the top. And so the interesting thing is they had not done a pregnancy test before they got this CT done. So do you guys have any thoughts? I'm thinking about an ectopic. And um, Swachanda says ruptured right-sided ectopic. Right, so that was what we thought. And then they did, uh, so by that time, we tried to hold off till there was some pregnancy test done and the pregnancy test was negative. Um, and I don't know, for some reason, I thought that that might be a false negative. So I still insisted that, you know, they have to consider ectopic pregnancy. Um, and we asked them to do, um, so there was an ultrasound done. So if you want to just um, start to see the patient, patient information, but this was what they saw on the right side. And... So this is normal. And then there was very little flow in this adnexal soft tissue. So it would be like a torsed ovary with a um, with hemoperitoneum, I guess. I don't know. Yes, why. so that was what that was what was called. And um, so there, there were two things. So the, on the CT, we thought it was, or on the CT, we thought we called it possible ruptured ectopic. And on the ultrasound, it was called as a um, Tossed ovary, so the patient was taken to the uh, taken to the OR, and it just turned out to be a ruptured hemorrhagic cyst on path. They didn't find a tossed ovary, so the ovary was not tossed. So apparently, this was is what I'm guessing an, a hemorrhagic cyst which ruptured, and all the hemoperitoneum. I just hadn't seen so much hemoperitoneum secondary to just a hemorrhagic cyst. I have at least seen that once or twice. I mean, if people have unrecognized uh, bleeding disorders like von Willenbrand's or something like that, they can just rupture a cyst and then create a lot of hemoperitoneum. Okay, so I mean, we didn't even, frankly, even consider it. We asked them to do an ultrasound and then an ultrasound was read as something else. So we thought maybe, you know, it was a tossed ovary which, which caused the hemo hemoperitoneum, but it just turned out to be an emergency system. It's just an interesting case. Yeah, it's like, a really good reminder because like I've actually- We forget, seen, exactly. I've, I've seen hemoperit like massive hemoperitoneum from a ruptured cyst and I still didn't even think of it, so. Yeah, that, that's that's the reason I just thought I'd show it is we, we did not even think about it, so. But that's all I have. Awesome. Anyone else? I'm no good at it, sorry. What'd you say? I'm no good for cases today. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. I thought you said something about SAR and I was like, yeah, we're getting, I'll see you in SAR, soon at SAR. So thanks everyone. See you later.